I'm Sam Roberts of The New York Times, and welcome to The New York Times Close Up. The Tony nominations will be announced in a few days. The Broadway season slim on musicals, strong on plays, wrapped up this week. We've seen the great Glenda Jackson return to the stage as King Lear. There have been late entries eligible for the Tonys, including Tootsie, based on the movie starring Dustin Hoffman. There are also productions like The Share Show that got lukewarm reviews but still sell plenty of tickets. In a few minutes, you'll get the big picture on the Broadway season from the Times' co-chief theater critics, Ben Brantley and Jesse Green. But we begin with the New York City's public advocate, Jumani Williams. He served on the city council, ran a strong but losing race for lieutenant governor, and was elected public advocate in February, coming out on top in a crowded 17-candidate race. He got an enthusiastic endorsement from the New York Times, which read in part, he is the right person to fight for the millions of New Yorkers frustrated with the city's subways struggling to find affordable housing in its neighborhoods and waiting to have their voices heard. Well, you've gotten elected now, and a belated congratulations. How, at the end of your term, or your first term perhaps, will people know that you have been public advocate? Well, first, thank you. Thanks for having me. And uh, that was an awesome endorsement uh, from the New York Times. So I'm glad you read a piece of that. Um, well, one, a lot of people don't even know who the public advocate is or what the public advocate does. And it is a, a very vital role. And when they first created it, they said they wanted it to be a position that would rise above politics and make decisions that are best for the people of the city of New York. And I plan to continue using the voice that I use in the city council to raise issues uh, as a public advocate, as a citywide elected official. So my plan is that the issues that I raise and the solutions that we point out get enacted. And that will help people know what this office is, why it's so important, uh, even less about who I am but why this office needs to be here and the impact it can have on their daily lives. The most public public advocate arguably was Mark Green because he had Rudy Giuliani as a foil. Why do we need a public advocate? We have an independent budget office, we have a stronger council, and considering that we now have a city council charter revision commission, how would you strengthen the powers of the pu of the public advocate uh, if we should do that? Now Mark Green was a, 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 one of the people that people think of when they think of public advocate. He was the first one. We were very honored to have his endorsement as well. But, um, this is one that's been interesting to me. People have said that um, the public advocate isn't strong enough, so some people say we should get rid of it, as opposed to how we should make it stronger, which is a, a, the natural thing. And so the Charter Commission was... Uh, really recognize the importance of the role, and they presented some things of how to make it stronger that I agree with. One is I think the number one thing is you have to have an independent budget. Uh, to be a watchdog, you shouldn't be thinking about whether your budget is going to be cut or not. So you should be have an independent budget and subpoena power. We do have the one of the powers that was given to the city to the public advocate was a charter cop, making sure that agencies are doing their charter mandated duties. We have a right to ask for information, and that has to be respected. But when it's not, the question of what to do next is questionable. So clearly defined subpoena power would help empower the public advocate uh, to do his job better. In terms of why we need it, I think most folks who live in New York City understand that sometimes the bureaucracies can be confusing. And so the position, the power that the public advocate has is one is legislatively, you can introduce legislation. Uh, you can act as an ombudsman, basically making sure uh, they're a go-between between the people and the government. I mentioned the charter cop status, which is critically important. And you make appointments to things like city planning commission. You also have a vote on the pension board to make sure our retirees can live their best lives based on how we invest and not invest. And those are critically important things, particularly in a time such as now when people are wary about the mayor. And sometimes, to, to some extent, the council are doing the things that they're supposed to do on behalf of the people of the city of New York. Speaking of being wary about the mayor, are you... He is uh, going around the country testing the waters, possibly to run for president. Uh, and yet uh, the Times had a story the other day, an editorial talking about the fact that lots of positions in the city government remain unfilled. You've talked about uh, his commitment to affordable housing. And of course, that depends on how we define affordable, uh, pointing out that a lot of that 
affordable housing is not affordable to my, many poor people. What kind of job do you think he is doing? I've said this and I haven't been shy about saying it. I endorsed the mayor in 2013. Uh, the mayor that uh, I endorsed then hasn't been the mayor that I've seen so often in executing some of these uh, policies. But is Definitely that natural? I mean, it's a little bit like Mario Cuomo said, uh, you know, running for office is poetry and governing is prose, that it's a lot harder well, once you have the job. That is actually a fact. Uh, but, you know, it was a, the, the mayor was really the person pushed position to be the blue wave before the blue wave came. And so I always look to see what is it that you had the power to do and then didn't do. Now, the housing plan, for example, and uh, mandatory inclusionary housing, which people may not have heard of, but they see the zonings that are going on in the city. The zoning proposal in particular has been a failure. And many of us pointed that out when it was being passed. And had we used the powers that we had to make the changes that folks want to see now, we'd be in a, nut, a much different position. And the question is, why didn't we do it when we had the time to do it years ago so we'd be in a better position? And people, there's no real good answer for that. When it comes to transparency in government, uh, when, it, when you talk about uh, the Amazon deal, uh, when you talk about how that went down, and I'm happy that people's voices were heard, but I'm unhappy that we missed an opportunity to have a genuine discussion about what coming here means and how we can change perhaps their business practices. Are you unhappy that we didn't get Amazon? Well, I'm, what I'm unhappy is that we should have had a discussion with Amazon uh, about the issues that we have and some of their business practices, and use the power of New York to perhaps change it. Whenever, whenever someone says they're going to bring $25,000 jobs, we have a right to have that discussion. That was taken away from us because of what the mayor and the governor did with Jeff Bezos. And then people are trying to shift blame on those of us who said, the deal that was cut is so bad that we have no other, there's no other, there's no other thing for us to do but to push back on it. And that's not the fault of the people who saw a deal that really, when you start digging into it, Amazon themselves said, we don't want to answer these questions and just leave. Whereas if it was done in the reverse and people actually were beginning to engage, we might have had a very real discussion about what it actually means if Amazon came here. Without getting into the weeds of this, you mentioned the rezoning. How do you reconcile the fact that people are calling, crying for more affordable housing but don't want more density in their neighborhood, which would allow more affordable housing to be built. It's interesting. Generally speaking, I ask, when I'm in a, uh, a group of people who are talking about height, I ask three questions. I ask, do you think homelessness uh, is at an all-time record high? Everybody raises their hand. Do you think that most of the answer to homelessness is additional housing? Everybody raises their hand. Do you want a taller building next to you? Nobody raises their hand, anyone, anywhere in the city, but primarily, right? Um, and then I, people begin to, begin to realize the conflict of solving the problem. And so what I have said is I would like to see contextual zoning. I, I think we can ask communities, uh, where are the areas that you want to try to preserve right now? But in exchange for that, we have to give up some additional density. The problem is I've seen with this administration in particular, and administrations in general, is they tend to do things with people. Uh, I'm sorry, do things to people, not with them. Mm -hmm. And in the public advocates office, I'm trying to redesign that office so that at least there's a venue for people to be able to communicate with government in a way that they feel is meaningful because right now they don't. And I think if you present the question that way, they'll get together and say, okay, here's where we can give some, but here's where we need to leave some. But what we've seen is knee-jerk reactions to everything, and that's not helpful to anyone. One of the ways they're communicating with government now in a formal process is where to put jails that would replace Rikers Island. Are you in favor of those four new sites? Again, the, the problem is doing things to people instead of with them. It's unfortunate that we've given them a, 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 an excuse to say, we didn't have the proper communications. I support the closing of Rikers, but, and I support moving forward with this plan. But, uh, it is unfortunate the way that we moved forward with it. I am continuing to look at what's happening in the Bronx. That seems to be the one uh, where there is uh, the most contention of where it could be. But most of the places that they're going uh, seems to, to make sense. But we have to listen to the communities and try to mitigate their concerns or else it's not going to work. We can't just come shove things in without saying, hey, I understand your concerns. Even though I don't live here, what you're saying is still valid. And I think that's what's been missing uh, in this discussion. Everybody complains about the subways. Who should 
be accountable for them? Who should have the responsibility? Hashtag Cuomo's MTA. Uh, he is the person who is in charge. You cannot come take pictures with the uh, Second Avenue subway. You cannot cancel out years and million dollars of work for the L chain uh, shutdown and then say you're not the person who makes the decisions. He's about to chase out Andy Byford. Right? So what needs to happen is we have to definitely restructure the entire board. I support most of what the, the speaker, Corey Johnson, has put forth only if we still get funds from the, the, the state and if we have real control over the decisions that are being made. Because right now, we put in the city about over 60% of the budget already, but we have nearly no control over what's going but on. But shouldn't it be a regional control, not just a city subway? It depends where the funds are coming from. So if we're going to be expected to put over 60% of the budget, then we should have a significant amount of control. We should definitely have uh, more control than what we have now, which is almost nil. Quick last question. Who should be exempt from congestion pricing? Well, I'm just happy that we even have this discussion. And I realize the people who push back, I always ask them, well, do you drive to the city on a daily basis? They say no. If we're going to keep raising prices on strap hangers, we have to look at people who drive. I'm a person who drives. There has to be some exemptions. We can't go out of, like, this whole thing about all of New Jersey may be exempt might be too much. But people who are elderly, people who are on a, a, um, a really low fixed in income, but people who have the ability to get in another way and choose not to, you know, there's no exemptions there. Thanks to Jumani Williams, the new public advocate. And coming up next, the Broadway season ranged from electrifying performances by Brian Cranston in network to what the Times called a joyful hoot of a musical called The Prom. Times Chief Theater critics will give you their overview in a minute. This has been quite a season on Broadway. It brought us to Kill a Mockingbird with a script by Aaron Sorkin, a revival of the classic Kiss Me Kate with music and lyrics by Cole Porter and starring Kelly O'Hara. Just a few days ago, Town, based on a Greek myth, it started out as a concept album, is now a Broadway production, the Times called Sumptuous and Hypnotic. And who better to wrap up the season than the co-chief theater critics of the New York Times, Ben Brantley and Jesse Green. So we've got the uh, Tony nominations coming up this week. Any guesses or any favorites that you think should be uh, the nominees? Well, I mean, I think you mentioned To Kill a Mockingbird first. That has a whole lot of money behind it, and it's certainly a hit. It's a popular favorite, I think, with the kind of people who vote, uh, the Tonys. Its stiffest competition would probably be The Ferryman, uh, which is an old-fashioned, incredibly well-structured play that keeps a, a gigantic cast, uh, all the moving parts, moving very precisely and sort of suspensefully. And then you've got, uh, you know, the oddball, like, what the Constitution means to me, which is, it's, I mean, thank God, a play like that can be on Broadway this season, like the revival of Oklahoma. I mean, who'd have thought that kind of non-traditional production would ever make it to Broadway? There are so mm -hmm. many unusual kinds of shows, mm -hmm. both musicals and plays, that opened this season that it's a little harder than usual to predict mm -hmm. what the Tony nominators are going to do, but it's, it's a good sign, at least in new plays. The right. new play season was quite wonderful. The, revi the musical revivals you mentioned, Oklahoma. Oklahoma almost played like a new play, right? Uh, but there weren't. Really there were good. only. Have you seen it, Sam? Uh, not yet. There were only two musical right. revivals right. at all, so that that category is going to have well two nominees, and one of them will win it. Uh, and of course, normally we're complaining. There's nothing but revivals. What's right. going on? So. But it's quite flipped this year. Yeah. One of the things both of you have written in the Times is that the new plays by black playwrights have been. Absolutely spectacular things you just haven't seen in years. Yes, but that's not on Broadway for the right. most part. Uh, that's off-Broadway productions. But yes, in, in the Sunday's Arts and Leisure, there's a, a very exciting section, a roundtable 
uh, with four of those playwrights. A terrific essay by Wesley Morris. Jesse and I single out the moments that have excited us most in the past five years. I mean, it's incredible how dense it's been. We chose why, why ten plays. Why is that, do you think? I mean, people have written before. The talent has been there before. Why is it coming out or being showcased I think now? Donald Trump is a, a great muse, <laughs> in part. Well, some, one <laughs> some of the, of the playwrights has actually right. said that. Right. Uh, but also the uh, continuing push for years by playwrights of color to get their work seen yeah. at off-Broadway theaters has begun to pay off when the artistic directors start to program them. Right. And then when they program them and they get incredible feedback from audiences, sometimes controversially, sometimes people are not happy with the shows, but that's okay too. Right. And then they program more and then that develops more playwrights. And, th they, and also because uh, they're getting their start off Broadway, they tend to be much more experimental. Right. Mm -hmm. and, and that's it. It's not just the same. They don't have to make money necessarily. Right. Uh, no, but they do attract attention in the right ways and open conversations in the right ways, I think. I mean, Jesse was saying because they're off Broadway, they can afford to take a few more risks uh, formalistically. And that's what's exciting. You think it, this must have been like what it must have been like to see Edward Albee early on. Mm -hmm. And, the, and yes, ma and many of these playwrights point to Albany right, as one right, of their inspirations. Right, Jackie Sibley's Drury, Fairview, which just won the Pulitzer Prize, is a truly upsetting play, and I think it's good. I mean, especially for a white theater goer, and I think it's great when a, when a play can do that, when it can grab you by the lapels and and shake you up and shock you just a little bit. It's been a long time since that had happened. What are they thematically? Are they attuned to black audiences? Are they about racial subjects? Or They're about are they... the unbridgeable chasm between black and white, I'd say, mm. as much as anything else. Certain, certainly Susan Laurie Park's most recent, White Noise. Yeah, and, and the other thing they are often dealing with is violence against yes. young black men, um, uh, but not in direct ways. Not, uh, there was a, and Ben's essay speaks to this in this Sunday's special section about the difference of how race is figured on Broadway mm -hmm. versus off Broadway. There was a play on Broadway this season called American Sun. I don't think we expect do we expect any nominations for? I wouldn't. That, maybe for Kerry Washington. Maybe for Kerry Washington, who right. played a black mother of, of a boy whose father was white. And it's one of these kinds of scenarios. But it was a very kind of straight ahead uh, traditional drama, whereas the way that same subject is treated off Broadway is miles different. Like slave play is. Mm -hmm. The last 20 minutes of that are the most harrowing single dialogue I've listened to in 20 years, maybe. Yeah, I thought that was just amazing. extraordinary. Have we reached a point where any of these plays can move either financially, socially, culturally to Broadway and succeed? I think in institutional theaters, for sure. I mean, like Manhattan Theater Club or Second Stage. Uh, and and some with some very uh, savvy and committed producers, you might find commercial productions as well. We were saying before, on Broadway this year, there were a number of plays you just wouldn't have dreamed right. would get to Broadway. Uh, ben mentioned What the Constitution Means to Me, which is a one-woman show about being a, you know, a debater in high school, in junior high school, and, and what's wrong with the Constitution. That does not scream Broadway mm -hmm. to anybody, and yet the uh, off-Broadway production was moved to Broadway, partly, I would imagine, for political reasons, well, because they want timing. that story out there now in mm -hmm. time for the election. It opened just after the Scowcroft hearing. So uh, it not Scowcroft. Uh, Scowcroft, uh, sorry. <laughs> Kavanaugh. Kavanaugh Close. hearings. Right. Oops. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> is there any thread that ties together the hits on Broadway this year, the, the possible mm -hmm. uh, Tony nominees? There's what a what lot do they have in common? There's, there are a lot that are, uh, have to do with hell. And yes. the devil, and we've got two musicals that are actually at least partly set in hell: Hades Town and Beetlejuice. Mm -hmm. uh, we have Rupert Murdoch as the devil himself, basically in ink. A lot of fog in these shows. A lot yeah. of like Stygian fog yeah. creeping up from or cigarette smoke or in ink. Cigarette smoke. <laughs> yeah, there's and and me, well that touches on ink also touches on media right. and the relationship of media and politics. So ink is the story of Rupert Murdoch's early years in in England when he was uh, bought the Sun and turned it into the tabloid it became. Another timely subject. Exactly, and with, by the end of the play, implications for Fox News. Uh, so we have the intersection of media and politics, also in a new play called Hillary and Clinton, yeah. uh, which is a quasi-fictional look at uh, 
uh, Hillary Clinton in New Hampshire. Uh, it's by Lucas Hanaith, is that how you pronounce Hanaith, it? Hanaith, yeah. Hanaith, uh, who wrote A Doll's House Part Two. I mean, there's not a thought in it. I don't think that anyone who's read much about the Clintons hasn't had. Right. On the other hand, it is so beautifully directed mm. and acted by Laurie Metcalf as Hillary and John Lithgow as, as Bill Clinton. It, and of course, speaking of media, we have Network as well. And Network, yeah. That, yeah. of course. That's, uh, uh, although it's not new, it reads as if it had been written for this moment. And well, I couldn't imagine anything topping the film, but uh, Brian Cranston is just Amazing. Well, what I think is kind of, I mean, revolutionary is an overused word, but what's so exciting and fresh about his performance is the way, is the dialogue he has with the camera mm -hmm. that's, that's, simulca that's you know, simulcasting his image as he speaks. He's so aware of it, and his character really only comes alive underneath the gaze of the lens. There's one moment when he's being tracked by two cameras, and you can see him going to this and to this, and we're seeing the image up on the screen. And To Kill a Mockingbird, does it work? On stage? We may have disagreed on this. A to little some bit. I think it works. I think it's a sop to a certain kind of good hearted, liberal, white, middle class theater goer. I don't disagree with that, but I admire it maybe a little more for taking a kind of intractable novel, which has been adapted before very poorly. Mm -hmm. I don't mean the movie, but mm -hmm. to other theatrical versions, they, they don't work. And this works because it alters it significantly and does exactly what Ben right. just said. So at the same time as it's being quite successful, uh, it, it, it also kind of thins out and simplifies the very vague morality of the novel. And Ben, the late entry uh, that you seem to love, uh, Tootsie. No, that was Jesse. Oh, I'm sorry, <laughs> Jesse. We disagree a lot. Yeah. I liked Tootsie a lot. Is it perfect? No. There were actually no perfect musicals this year, except I would say... Oklahoma, Oklahoma got as close as it's done, which yeah. is a right. remarkable thing to say yeah. about a show that was written in 1943 and had long since passed into the community theater, high school theater, you know, waste bin, basically. And it does feel brand new. And at the same time, it's not like they're imposing an interpretation. It's all coming from within it's the in show there. itself. Yeah. But but as far as Tootsie's concerned, you know, uh, I laughed straight through the, the show. That is not what I look for in every thing. But if it's a comedy. I'd like that to be one of the features. That's not a bad <laughs> uh, test for a comedy. And and I did, and I needed that by by this time of year, mm. and uh, for I, that I, reason. I didn't hate it. Oh, well, <laughs> that's, there's a recommendation. That'll be the underslam. You can put that on the marquee. Thanks to Ben Brantley, Jesse Green, co-chief theater critics of the New York Times, and I'll add some thoughts on CODA next. Remember the old adage, it's not what you say, it's how you say it? No matter how I say this, I don't think the saying matters anymore. In an era where four-letter words are spoken on cable TV, when they appear on the front page of newspapers quoting the president, when rap music is punctuated by once taboo racial slurs, Americans are closing our minds by demanding that others close their mouths. It's not the first time, of course. In 1798, Congress passed the Alien and Sedition Acts, which criminalized false statements about the government. During the Civil War, editors and reporters were imprisoned without due process for opposing the draft and the income tax. Exactly a century ago, Five assemblymen were elected from New York City, but were ejected from the legislative chamber in Albany by the sergeant-at-arms because they were socialists. In 1966, Julian Bond was denied his seat by fellow legislators in Georgia because he publicly opposed the war in Vietnam. And earlier this year, Two New York City Council members were stripped of their committee chairmanships because of something they said. Ruben Diaz Sr. of the Bronx said the council was, quote, controlled by the homosexual community. He has made homophobic remarks before, but whatever he meant in this case, it so happens that the council speaker, Corey Johnson, is gay. Kalman Yeager of Brooklyn referred on Twitter to so-called Palestinians 
and said that Palestine does not exist. A state of Palestine is, in fact, recognized by more than 100 United Nations members, but not including the United States and most of the European Union. Johnson, whose title, remember, is Speaker, disbanded Diaz's Committee on Four Higher Vehicles. He booted Yeager from the Committee on Immigration. Johnson's explanation sounded reasonable. His job, he said, is to make sure all people and all communities feel seen, heard, and respected. You have a right to free speech, the speaker said, but you don't have a right to a committee on the city council. On some campuses, students are complaining that free speech guarantees, quote, to prioritize the protection of ideas over the protection of people. Well, can't we do both? Coupled with free speech is the right to listen or not to. Norman Siegel, the former director of the Civil Liberties Union in New York, says, quote, certain interest groups under the banner of quality, diversity, and justice want to retaliate and punish the people who express their views, even if their views are sensitive, repugnant, and wrong-minded. But that's what free speech is about. Even President Trump urged students to, quote, listen to the other point of view. Maybe you can be changed and maybe not. I doubt it, but maybe you never know. As Harvard Law professor Jeannie Sue Gerson wrote in The New Yorker, Trump's own behavior notwithstanding, he had a point. For The New York Times and CUNY TV, I'm Sam Roberts.